We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. I have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister does she believe that Scotland's schools are staffed with enough teachers? First Minister. Well, the Education Secretary and indeed I have been very open about the recruitment challenges that there are in parts of our education system. That is why uh, we have been focused on making sure we're attracting the best and brightest people into the teaching profession, making it easier in partnership with the General Teaching Council for Scotland to get teachers into the classroom and we will continue to take that action. We have funded local authorities over the past uh, number of years to maintain the numbers of teachers in our schools and that's absolutely the right thing to do as part of our overall programme of reform in education to make sure we're driving up standards and closing the gap in attainment. Ruth Davison. Presiding officer, the simple and correct answer there was no, there aren't. Um, because here are the figures. Since the SNP came to power, the number of teachers has fallen from 55,000 to just under 51,000, down by more than 4,000. And when schools need supply teachers to fill in, they're struggling more and more. This week, we contacted councils right across Scotland to find out how the stock of supply teachers had fallen in recent years. And here are the facts. In the Scottish borders, there's been a drop of more than a third in supply teachers since 2011. In Edinburgh, it's even worse, where the numbers have halved. And in Glasgow alone, over the same time frame, we have lost one thousand supply teachers. So fewer teachers, more vacancies and fewer supply teachers to fill in when needed. How can the First Minister defend that? First Minister. For all teacher numbers, as we have debated in this chamber many times in the past, uh, over a period of years, the numbers of teachers will fluctuate in line with fluctuations in the number of pupils in our schools. But in recent years, we have, and this is a statement of fact, presiding officer, we have funded local authorities as pupil numbers started to rise to also maintain teacher numbers so that we can broadly maintain the teacher-pupil ratio as well. That is a fact. In terms of uh, teacher recruitment challenges, uh, we have in recent times opened up, as I said earlier, in partnership with the General Teaching Council for Scotland, 11 new routes to get teachers into the classrooms to make it easier to get the best and brightest in our teaching profession into classrooms doing what they do best. We've also increased the future intake uh, for teacher training. This year, I think we've uh, reduced that, uh, increased that rather by just short of 400, by about 370. Uh, we've asked the General Teaching Council to look at what more can be done to motivate supply teachers. So we're taking a range of actions to make sure that we have the right numbers of teachers in our schools teaching our young people. And of course, that is part of the wider programme that I spoke about. We have taken the decision as part of our budget this year to get £120 million directly into the hands of head teachers so that they can invest those resources in the things they believe will have the biggest impact on raising attainment. And if that's more staff, uh, whether teaching staff or specialist staff in particular areas, that is for the discretion of head teachers. So we continue to take the action that is required to be taken to get standards up in our schools generally and to close that attainment gap. And we will continue to focus on exactly that. Ruth Davidson. She's standing there asking for applause for cleaning up her own mess. This isn't a fluctuation. We're more than 4,000 right. teachers down. Right. And what we've learned this week is the real cost of teacher shortages. And it got rather drowned out by the First Minister's referendum plans. But Education Scotland made clear that the recruitment crisis we face is damaging the quality of education in Scotland, not just in primary school, but in secondary school too. And according to the head of School Leaders Scotland, the shortage is such that head teachers are having to take on staff, not because they're right for the job, but because they're the only ones available. Does the First Minister think that this is a decent return for 10 years of SNP government? First Minister. Well, we have plenty of evidence of improving standards in our schools. I can point to, I can point to the record exam passes that young people are achieving in our schools. I can point to uh, the record positive destinations uh, of young people leaving our schools, going into employment, further education, 
or training. I can point to at the beginning of the closing of the attainment gap, although I readily recognise there is much more work to do. Yes, we have a challenge when it comes to recruitment of teachers in particular areas, and that's not unique to Scotland. But what we are doing, as I set out in my previous answer, is taking a range of actions to ensure that we meet that challenge. So we will continue to focus on exactly that. The programme of reform in education, I've already mentioned the additional funding going direct to head teachers, uh, the attainment challenge focusing on literacy and numeracy, the in introduction, which I know not everybody in this chamber agrees with, of national assessments so that we can uh, publish robust information about the performance in our schools and measure the improvements that we are taking. Uh, this is a comprehensive programme of reform and I and the Deputy First Minister will continue to be absolutely focused on delivering it. Ruth Davison. The First Minister is going through actions that are being taken, but that's only necessary because her government has been asleep at the wheel for the last decade. And the real question here is about this government's priorities. This week, Sir Tom Hunter wrote in a national newspaper setting out some of the positive steps that are finally being taken, like leadership development for head teachers to ensure we get better leaders in our schools. And he also talks up the work that's being done by Skills Development Scotland to help link up young people with employers. But he finished his piece with this. Let me read it to you. Scotland faces challenges. So I ask, is independence our biggest priority? And Sir Tom is, oh, you've grown if you like, but Sir Tom is only asking the question that a lot of people want answered. Separation or education? Which is it, First Minister? First Minister. Firstly, in terms of education, I know there are many things that Ruth Davidson doesn't like to acknowledge. For example, the around 30% increase in higher passes since 2007, the 90% of young people going into positive destinations, uh, the improvement we are seeing in closing the attainment gap, uh, the increase in early years and uh, childcare, which is so crucial to closing that attainment gap in schools, uh, the additional resources going into the hands of head teachers. And yes, as Ruth Davidson has just spoken about the extra support, which uh, John Swinney was talking about just this very week, to head teachers making sure we've got the best leadership in our schools. But, you know, let's come back to this point about who is concentrating on these matters and who, at every opportunity, tries to shoehorn in the reference to the Constitution. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how Ruth Davidson spends her week when she's not appearing in comedy shows or talking about independence. Here's just some of the things I do in an average week. £10 million to support a food and drink sector. Signing an economic partnership agreement with Bavaria. This is just the last few days. Chairing a cabinet meeting that decides the content of our social security bill, that continues work on our 2018 budget plans, that talks about what we're doing to reduce cancer waiting times, finalising the mental health strategy, which will be published this very day, convening a meeting with the social security minister to talk about our new social security agency, announcing 300 new jobs in the city of Glasgow. Talking to talking to manufacturing companies about how we boost that sector of our economy. Reviewing, yes, with the Deputy First Minister, our education reform programme. Uh, talking to the Transport Scotland and the Transport Minister about the Queensferry crossing. I could go on, presiding officer, but I know I'm running out of time. So let me focus on some of the things other ministers have been doing while the opposition talk about their priorities. The Health Secretary funding to widen access to medical schools funding to increase cervical cancer screening, the Education Secretary funding for support for head teachers, the Public Health Minister extending the Family Nurse Partnership, the Children's Minister setting out plans to double childcare and of course last but not least the Community Secretary support for young homeless people who are having their housing benefit removed by the Conservative Government at Westminster. I'll take no lectures. I'll take no lectures about the day job. It's just a pity 
So much of our day job is spent cleaning up the mess made by a Tory government. Presiding officer, uh, the First Minister talks about priorities. Now, is she really coming here? I know she's had a tough week and I know it's getting worse. <laughs> but is she really coming here to say, after forcing a two-day debate on independence, forcing through a referendum that, against the wishes of the people of Scotland, forcing through a vote on that, that she's going to stand here and still say that education is her priority, where her government hasn't debated education on government time in this chamber since October. How does she answer that? No education since October, independence every single day. First Minister. Because the difference between this government and the Tories is that they debate and we deliver. Yeah. 120. Davidson, what we've delivered in government time and with government money, £120 million for head teachers to improve standards in our schools. So I'll continue to allow Ruth Davidson and the Tories to debate with each other. I'll go on with delivering for the people of Scotland. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. More engagements to deliver for the people of Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, one thing the First Minister hasn't done is deliver justice for the survivors of MESH, a group of women who I met uh, just a few days ago. Women whose lives have been destroyed by a medical procedure that was supposed to help them get better. One woman I spoke with can't sit down without being in excruciating pain. Others have been paralysed. These women feared that the review into the use of mesh products would be a whitewash. And First Minister, that is exactly what it is. In their own words, these women have been left dismayed, disgusted and betrayed. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to apologise to the women who have been so badly let down? First Minister. Of course, I, I am deeply sorry for the suffering uh, of these women, the women uh, Kezia Dugdale mentions, and many other who have suffered complications because of treatment with MESH. Now, as Kezia Dugdale knows, the Health Secretary will make a statement in this very chamber this afternoon on this issue. Uh, the independent review, which was instructed by this government to look into these very issues, was published on uh, Monday of this week. That review contains eight important conclusions that health boards across this country will now be expected to take forward. Uh, the Health Secretary has recently met uh, with uh, two of the women who have been uh, understandably quoted in the media, uh, Olive McElroy and Elaine Holmes, to hear directly in person their views. Uh, she uh, met the women to make clear that the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group's views have been heard, uh, and more than that, that as we take this work forward, we want to make sure that their views remain at the centre of it. The chair of the review has ensured that all evidence that informed the review was made publicly available alongside the report when that report uh, was published. So I am very grateful to all the members of the review for the considerable time and effort that they have dedicated uh, to this really important piece of work over uh, the past number uh, of years. Uh, the Health Secretary will set out in further detail this afternoon the actions that will now be taken to make sure that these recommendations uh, are implemented in full and I hope the Chamber uh, will welcome uh, the Health Secretary's statement when she makes it later. Kezia Dugdale. That is a welcome apology but make no mistake there has been a cover-up and this is a national scandal. Whatever the Minister says this after afternoon the report has been compromised because we know that the original draft report was supported by all members of the review group but the final report has lost the faith of those involved. And that's why the chair, the clinical expert and the patient's representatives have all resigned. Even the First Minister's own successor as Health Secretary, Alex Neil, said it was totally unacceptable. Most importantly of all, countless women 
whose lives have been destroyed by this think it's a whitewash. If these women don't have any faith in the report, how possibly can the First Minister? First Minister. Well, look, I, think, I think there are extremely important issues involved here. Can I just, as, as a matter of fact, and not to under play any of the issues involved. The chair uh, resigned for personal reasons, not for uh, any reasons associated with concern about uh, the report, as far as I uh, am aware. I, I take very seriously the responsibility, and I know the Health Secretary does too, as, as we move forward from the statement that Shona Robinson will give this afternoon to implement these recommendations, that we do work really hard to make sure that we build the faith of those who have been affected by this. And that is uh, one of the most important responsibilities we have. Uh, the report, as I said earlier on, uh, and this was a point uh, that the Health Secretary uh, made very clear uh, to establish with the chair of the review, all of the evidence uh, that informed that review has been made publicly available alongside the report. So it is there available for anybody to read. The recommendations in this report must now be taken forward and they must now be taken forward in a way that has the confidence of the women who have been affected. And that, well, I, I would ask members uh, to wait to hear the statement that Shona Robinson will make this afternoon. They will have the opportunity, uh, rightly and properly, to ask questions about uh, that statement. But Shona Robinson will set out clearly the steps that will, be now, uh, that will now be taken to make sure that all the right action is taken, but in a way that restores the confidence and the faith of the women affected. That is a responsibility I take seriously with the Health Secretary. And I hope when uh, that statement is made to Parliament this afternoon, uh, members across the Chamber, I know they will ask searching questions as they are right to do, but I hope there will be support for the uh, actions that the Health Secretary will set out. Kezia Dugdale. Also, the women want to have faith in this process, but they also want to see some action too. Here's an email from Sophie. She is 18 and the daughter of a MESH survivor. Sophie emailed Shona Robinson at half past two this morning as she cared for her mother. And her email said this, I'm struggling to remember my mum before Mesh took her from me. No, she's not dead, but she is a shell of the woman I'd previously loved, adored, and been inspired by. You should live a day in our life. On the days when the pain is so bad, my fiercely independent mum can't even brush her own teeth. Given what she knows about this, if a doctor told the First Minister, or someone that she loves, that they should have this procedure, would she go ahead with it? Because Nicola Sturgeon's answer is no, or even if she isn't sure, then surely she must ban this devastating and dangerous practice once and for all. First Minister. I think, well, firstly, my heart goes out to the woman that Kezia Dugdale has just uh, referred to in the email on behalf of her daughter. Uh, but secondly, Kezia Dugdale rightly calls for action. That is exactly what the independent review was set up uh, to recommend and the Health Secretary will set out to Parliament this afternoon exactly that, the action that is now being taken. Issues like informed consent, genuinely informed consent are one of the issues. There is, uh, has been a suspension uh, on routine uh, procedures of this nature, although there has been the ability if women have uh, the information and are in pain and choose to go ahead to do so. But safety informed consent, making sure there is absolutely the right guidance in place. These are all at the heart of the recommendations that the Health Secretary will talk about this afternoon. One of the things that's, and I, I know this from, from my years spent as Health Secretary, uh, with some exceptions, even in the, the history of this parliament, Health Secretaries are, are rarely clinicians. We have to rely on expert clinical advice. Sometimes that advice can be contradictory and sometimes it can be very difficult to find the right way forward on the basis of that advice. We use our best endeavours to do so. That's why the independent review was set up. That's why all of the evidence that has informed the outcome of that review it has been published. I recognise, the Health Secretary recognises, that some of the women involved in this review have lost faith with that and therefore it is a crucial part of our responsibility to restore that faith. And the statement that the Health Secretary will make this afternoon outlining the action that we will take is a key part of that. So I do not expect members across this chamber to stop asking searching important questions on behalf 
of their constituents. I absolutely accept the importance of that, but I hope also we can build some consensus around the actions that will be outlined to the Chamber later this afternoon. Thank you. We've got two supplement, uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the Marchmont and Sheens Community Development Trust made a formal submission for a community interest bid for the Royal Sick Children's Hospital in my constituency. The Sick Kids is not just a hospital, but a beloved institution for so many people living in Edinburgh and beyond. It has touched the lives of thousands of patients and parents, including my own family. Will the First Minister give me and the whole community the assurance that this submission, which must be approved by ministers in the coming weeks, will be treated carefully and seriously by the government? There are clearly competing interests in this process, given that the government has both an interest in the sale of the site, but also must approve this bid as a valid community interest bid. Could the First Minister therefore spell out the criteria and approach that her government will use to assess this submission? Well, I, I know how important these issues are when a much-loved uh, hospital uh, is no longer used as a hospital. And in this case, of course, it is because we have a new sick kids hospital being built in Edinburgh, but the use of that site and, and what happens to that for a community is very important. The question that has been asked is, will we, will we as ministers make sure that careful and thorough consideration is given for the application that the member refers to? Absolutely, we will do. Uh, obviously, I cannot preempt uh, that consideration or that decision. Uh, but generally, and we see this through uh, legislation, for example, like the Community Empowerment Act, not just in cases like this, uh, part of what we want to do is make sure that communities are at the very heart of plans for the regeneration and redevelopment of areas uh, in their own areas. And these uh, principles and these criteria will very much be used to judge the application that the member refers to. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the Transport Minister confirmed that there have been over 700 separate deployments of temporary traffic lights on the A76 trunk roads in the last 1,000 days. Does the First Minister agree that this is unacceptable? And can she tell my constituents what action the Scottish Government will take to bring this strategically important route back up to standard? First Minister. Well, obviously we don't want the use of uh, temporary traffic lights where that can be avoided, but I'm sure all members and everybody listening to this will know that in instances where we have, for example, roadworks or where there might have been landslips or, or problems caused by weather, often that is unavoidable as roads are repaired. Uh, I am very happy to come back to the member on the detail, particularly of the number of times temporary traffic lights have been used on the A76. But what I would absolutely uh, say and agree with him about is that we want to keep that to a minimum. But sometimes work, repair work, on our road system is unavoidable and it is necessary to make sure we have an efficient and effective road system across our country. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday the 18th of April. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, coming just a day after the UK Government signalled its formal intention to withdraw not only from the EU but from the single market, something that even Leave campaigners promised wouldn't happen and which will rip away our freedom of movement and undermine recruitment in education, health, social care and throughout our economy. I personally found it astonishing to hear the Conservatives raise the issue of recruitment in public services. But today, but today that UK government is publishing its absurd repeal bill, covering huge areas of power which have no place being exercised by UK ministers. Can I ask what the First Minister's view is on the scope of that repeal bill? Does she agree that it must not be allowed to change legislation that is not specifically reserved under the Scotland Act? First Minister. Well, I think Patrick Harvey raises a number of important points. Firstly, he is absolutely right to point out that the biggest risk to recruitment in our public services right now is the one posed by the Conservatives in the form of Brexit. And it is quite breathtaking hypocrisy for any Conservative to stand up and talk about these issues without recognising the responsibility that they bear. Uh, secondly, on the Great Repeal Bill, this is hugely important, not just for this government, it is hugely important for this Parliament. Uh, one of the things that I think should concern everybody is the way in which uh, Conservative ministers at Westminster, uh, echoed by Conservative Party members in this chamber, choose their words so very carefully over this issue. 
They talk about not taking away any decisions that we already make here, as if we're somehow supposed to be grateful for that. But the issue, of course, around the Great Repeal Bill is about powers currently with the EU that if they are to be repatriated in areas that are currently wholly devolved, agriculture, fishing, for example, where should those powers go? Now, under the current terms of the Scotland Act, those powers should automatically come to this chamber. But nobody in the UK government, and I discussed this with the Prime Minister on Monday, nobody on the Conservative benches will give that guarantee, which leads me to suspect that what the Tories are actually planning is a power grab on this parliament. And that will be absolutely unacceptable. And when that happens, I don't expect the Tories I don't expect the Tories to back us up, but at that point I'll be looking very carefully at the Labour benches because surely not even Labour in those circumstances could stay subservient to the Tories. Surely even they would have to stand up for Scotland's interests. Patrick Harvey. It's not only the Scottish Government which should recognise the contempt that's been shown by the UK, it's all of this Parliament that should recognise that contempt. They've not only refused to discuss with Ministers the timing of Article 50 or any of the other details of their plans, they've refused to come and answer questions to our Parliamentary Committees which would give all of us, whatever our view on these matters, the ability to ask them serious questions. So, in the, face, in the face of that contempt that has been shown to Scotland by the UK government, we want to put the power over Scotland's future back into the hands of the voters who live here. The UK ministers want that power for themselves, the ability to rewrite laws by fiat without the normal checks and balances. Let's remember, this is the same UK government which promised to write into law the permanence of this parliament, the permanence of a parliament that 74% of people in Scotland voted to create, and they abandoned that promise as well. So, while UK ministers wish to seek for themselves that power to rewrite laws with a, the abuse of antique powers to bypass parliament, can I ask for the First Minister's commitment to ensure that there will be full parliamentary scrutiny because it's not only one parliament but all parliaments that need the ability to hold all ministers to account. First Minister. I absolutely agree with Patrick Harvey and before, before we get the usual arrogant sniggering from the Tory benches, everybody across this chamber who actually wants this parliament to be respected should agree with Patrick Harvey, Absolutely. because not just Scotland, but all of the devolved administrations have been treated with contempt by the UK government so far in this process. Patrick Harvey rightly said we didn't see the Article 50 letter before it was published. Uh, we didn't know when it was going to be published until we read it in the BBC. We didn't know uh, what it was going to say. To be fair, though, the Prime Minister did give me an insight into its contents uh, on Monday of this week. She told me, and this is a direct quote, she told me that the Article 50 letter would be not detailed, not short, but not lengthy either. <laughs> so I'm grateful to her for that insight into the government's thinking. But in case anybody, in case anybody is thinking, of course, that this is just me as a, a, an SNP First Minister complaining about the UK government, people... People should also listen to Carwin Jones, the First Minister of Wales, who yesterday said that, in his view, the devolved administrations had been treated with contempt and that it was the behaviour of the UK government that was doing more than anything else to undermine the United Kingdom. So I think it is really important that everybody across this chamber stands up for the rights of this parliament before we go any further in this process. And the last point I would make, presiding officer, which... I'm sure the Conservatives in particular will be interested in, because I, I, I've seen them, uh, Ruth Davidson, Adam Tompkins, Murdo Fraser, tweeting furiously this morning about research published by John Curtis. Well, let me point, let me point to a finding in this research. It asks respondents this question. It asks respondents this question. Uh, what did they think of this statement? Scotland is a nation 
and so should not have to leave the EU when a majority of Scots voted to stay. A majority of people agreed with that statement. So the fact of the matter is, people, people do not want Tory Brexit. The question is, what are we going to do to protect people from the impact of Tory Brexit? Some supplementary questions. The first from Lee MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this morning, a damning report into forensic medical services uh, provided to victims of sexual crime was published. It described the service that some receive as unacceptable. There are significant gaps in provision around the country, and we've fallen behind both best practice and services uh, elsewhere in the UK. The report also confirmed uh, that in the islands, uh, victims have to make often tra traumatic trips to the mainland for examination. I know the First Minister and the Justice Secretary uh, feel that is com it compounds uh, the trauma that they've suffered. So will the First Minister give a commitment to update this Parliament as soon as we return from recess on the actions that her government plans to take on the back of this report? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will be happy to ensure that there is a full ministerial statement made on this issue. I mean, I think all of us uh, agree that the consequences and the impact of rape and sexual assault are devastating and we must do all we can to support victims uh, when they suffer these heinous crimes. Uh, the government has announced today in response to this report that the Chief Medical Officer will chair a group of experts uh, from both health and justice to ensure that health boards improve the provision of appropriate healthcare facilities uh, for any victim who requires a forensic examination. And of course this will complement work that Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, is already doing to develop new national standards for use by health boards. Uh, there will be a consultation on those standards and they will be published by the end of this year. Uh, many people talk about the importance of the sexual assault referral centre model and that's certainly uh, one way of delivering uh, this care. We don't think it necessarily will work for all parts of Scotland but nevertheless it is vital that in all parts of Scotland uh, victims of sexual offences get the support that they require. Liam MacArthur rightly uh, raises the particular issues faced by island communities. Um, I know he is the MSP for Orkney but uh, he'll be interested, I know as will Tavish Scott, to I know that NHS Shetland has already made a public commitment to providing a holistic approach to victims of rape and sexual assault and they're already working to put in place the necessary equipment, accommodation and appropriately trained staff to ensure that they can deliver on that. And we will work with other health boards, in particular other island health boards, to make sure that the same uh, approaches are taken. Uh, one final point on this, uh, which is an important point. Uh, many victims of these kinds of crime, when they uh, have to undergo a forensic examination want that to be done uh, by a female doctor for reasons that all of us can absolutely understand. Uh, one of the issues we've been trying to understand better is why more female doctors don't come forward to work in this area and we've been working with NHS Education Scotland uh, to understand that they carried out a survey that closed at the end of February and we're working to uh, analyse those responses. So um, I recognise uh, that the report that's published today is not good enough and I uh, have no hesitation in saying that. We have work underway already uh, to address these challenges and the group that has been announced today, chaired by the Chief Medical Officer, will make sure uh, we take whatever further action is required. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the excellent investigative reporting by Richard Smith, David Leesky and Fraser and others in the Herald newspaper on the havoc caused by criminal enterprises conducted by Scottish limited partnerships across the world. Following a report on Monday that SLPs were involved in the £16 billion laundromat money laundering scheme, can the First Minister advise me whether the Scottish Government is considering any reforms to the criminal law of Scotland that could be deployed to crack down on the litany of crime being perpetrated under the cover of these secretive and unaccountable legal vehicles? And in particular, does she agree that a new offence of vicarious liability could be one way to hold to account the individuals and firms that incorporate SLPs involved in criminal activity in cases where they undertake no steps uh, of due diligence on the identity, motives or purposes of the partnerships they're responsible for creating? Well, I would thank Andy Whiteman for raising this issue. And let me also pay tribute to David Leask and his colleagues at the Herald for the excellent work they have done to shine a light on some of these practices. Uh, yes, we will continue to look at whether there is action we can take within our devolved powers to better tackle uh, these issues. Andy Whiteman has particularly raised the issue of an offence of vicarious liability. I 
for reasons he will understand. I will not give him an answer to that today, but I will ask the Justice Secretary, uh, as part of an overall uh, look at this, to, to consider that, uh, that option. Uh, as Andy Whiteman and other members know, uh, we're talking here about the conduct of limited partnerships. Much of the solutions to the problems that are identified here lie in the hands of the Westminster Government. We have been pressing the Westminster Government to act. Indeed, SNP MPs in the House of Commons have been uh, particularly vociferous in doing so, and we will continue uh, to press for action there. Uh, but we will not shy away from taking action if we have the ability to do that within our own power. So we will uh, continue to look at that, and I'll ask the Justice Secretary to respond in detail to Andy Whiteman in due course. And Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland has a great record in attracting investment, second only to London in recent years. Can the First Minister provide an update on inward investment and plans to reach out beyond our borders to attract jobs and growth to Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, it is really important, particularly now, that we do give a message that Scotland is open for business. Uh, we continue to be considered uh, as a prime business location for global companies looking for a foothold in and access to Europe. Just yesterday, I was able to visit uh, Genpact in Glasgow to announce their growth and expansion plans, which involve more than 300 new jobs for the city of Glasgow. I hope everybody across this chamber would find it within themselves to welcome that. And of course, the Ernst & Young Attractiveness Survey uh, which was, uh, is published regularly, highlights uh, that in the most recent one, we had a record level of investment projects uh, in Scotland. And of course, for some years now, we've seen that Scotland is the most successful part of the UK for inward investment outside of London and the South East. We need to work ever harder now uh, to continue that success, given the implications of Brexit. That's why we have been taking action, for example, to establish investment hubs in Dublin, in London uh, and in Berlin. And next week, I'll undertake a series series of engagements in the United States focused on creating jobs, opportunities and economic links for Scotland. Uh, so we'll continue to focus, uh, notwithstanding all of the challenges we face that are not of our making and doing everything we can to bring jobs and investment here to Scotland. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what further initiatives the Scottish Government will take to boost tourism in light of a 15.6% increase in attendance at Scotland's visit attractions in 2016. First Minister. Well, as these figures illustrate, this has been a record year for Scotland's leading visitor attractions as they again outperform the rest of the UK in terms of the growth in visitor numbers. The success of our leading visitor attractions will continue to play a vital role in making Scotland a destination of first choice for visitors from the UK and across the world. We'll continue to work with Visit Scotland and other stakeholders to explore how we can achieve the aims of our Tourism Scotland 2020 strategy, delivering a greater degree of connectivity than ever before through new direct air routes and maximising the economic impact of this key growth sector of our economy. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Last year was indeed a bumper year for Scottish tourism with visitor numbers growing more than twice as fast as the rest of the UK. And such attractions are vital in attracting visitors to Scotland uh, whose expenditure will serve to grow employment in our thriving tourism and hospitality sectors. However, the 10 most popular uh, UK attractions were all in London with the National Museum of Scotland the most visited attraction with 1.8 million visitors. In Ayrshire, our top attraction, Colleen Castle Country Park, was only 133rd. Whilst a wide range of attractions and excellent heritage and museum collections continue to provide high quality and exciting experiences, what more can be done to encourage people not just to make Scotland a destination of first choice, but visit areas such as Ayrshire when in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I absolutely share Kenny Gibson's uh, focus on the importance of getting the benefits of tourism uh, to all parts of our country, not just to our cities or our most famous attractions. And as somebody who was born and brought up in Ayrshire, I know there are many excellent visitor attractions in Ayrshire, including, of course, the fantastic Colleen uh, Castle. Uh, Scotland has got so much to offer tourists. Uh, we're not only steeped in history and heritage, we've got the best landscapes in the world. We've got a huge opportunity in capturing interest in marine tourism. So we will continue to work with partners, including in Ayrshire, uh, to implement, for example, our marine and coastal strategy, the very first of its kind in the UK, and that will have particular relevance to Kenny Gibson's constituency. So we'll uh, work with uh, everybody across Scotland to make sure that we're attracting more people to come to Scotland, to spend money here in Scotland, to enjoy everything that our country has to offer. Tourism is one of our most important and most successful economic sectors, and we have to do everything possible to make sure it continues to be so. Question five, Jamie Green. 
to ask the First Minister whether Police Scotland plans to increase the number of uh, armed officers. First Minister. Well, the number of armed police officers is principally an operational decision for the Chief Constable, who takes account of a range of factors, including intelligence reports and threat and risk assessments. Uh, I spoke to the Chief Constable last week, as I said in the Chamber, uh, at last week's FMQs after the tragic events at Westminster, and he assured me that he had the resources that he required to respond appropriately to that incident. Uh, and that, of course, included uh, the uplift in armed officers announced uh, last year. Uh, following uh, the incident in London last week, we saw a substantial increase in the numbers of armed officers on duty here in Scotland and a configuration of resources to ensure that there was a high profile non-armed police presence across the country as well. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, this is indeed an operational matter for the police, but we had very mixed messages yesterday. Uh, police chiefs have said that they are already match fit and don't see the need for more firearms officers. Uh, but the Scottish Police Federation, representing rank and file, has said that they don't have the capability right now to use armed police if required. Who does the First Minister think is right? First Minister. Well, we will always work to make sure that the police do have the resources they need. That is why in June last year uh, we agreed with the police, although this was driven by the judgment of the Chief Constable that there should be an increase in armed officers in Scotland of 124, uh, taking the total number to 479 officers. Uh, and in the wake of last week's incident, it was possible immediately for the Chief Constable to substantially increase, I think, in fact, almost double uh, the number of armed officers who were uh, on duty. Uh, I and the Justice Secretary have discussions with the Chief Constable and his colleagues on a regular basis, uh, obviously about policing in general, but given the threats we face right now, in particular about the capacity and capability of the police to deal uh, with the increased risk from terrorist uh, attacks. Uh, we will continue to do so. And as part of these discussions, of course, we continue to listen very carefully uh, to what rank and file officers uh, through the Scottish Police Federation tell us as well. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that only one in 18 schools were inspected last year. First Minister. Education Scotland is committed to increasing the number and frequency of inspections in future years. That's one of the reasons uh, why they have been undertaking a review of inspection approaches in consultation with schools and key stakeholders. Uh, these new approaches will help support the achievement of the twin aims of closing the attainment gap and raising the bar for all in Scottish education. Of course, it's important to add that in addition to inspections, Education Scotland also provides support to schools. Uh, they also, in 2015-16, carried out a review of every local authority and a specific inspection of Argyll and Butte's education functions. Ian Gray. But the fact is that Education Scotland has not been increasing. It has been reducing the number of inspections. In fact, the rate is less than half the rate of inspections in 2007 uh, when the SNP came to power. Does the First Minister not see that the problem here is that Education Scotland is inspecting its own delivery of educational policy and has clearly been deciding to do less of it? Will she accept that the merging of the inspectorate into Education Scotland was a mistake which should be reversed? First Minister. Well, on the, on the last point, these are matters that we are currently considering in the context of the Education and Governance Review, which we will report to, to Parliament on in due course. In terms of the trend uh, in the last couple of years around inspections, in 14-15 there was 138, uh, 143 in 15-16, 16, 16 uh, 17 I think is the same number. Uh, but as I said, Education Scotland is reviewing its approach to inspection with a view to increasing the number of inspections. But I'm, I have to say I'm quite perplexed by Ian Gray's question. Uh, when he seems to be saying uh, fairly legitimately in some respects that there's not enough inspections in our schools. But the reason I'm perplexed is because I remember very well uh, the speech that his party leader made in this chamber in September 2015 in response to me outlining the programme for government. When Kezia Dugdale said this, and this is a direct quote, the First Minister should immediately suspend all school inspection visits for one year. So had Labour been in power, there wouldn't have been 143 inspections in our schools. There would have been zero inspections in our schools, which is why I'm slightly perplexed by Ian Gray's question. Question number seven. 
Question number seven, Anas Sawa. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government has made on its commitment to reduce the number of working hours for junior doctors. First Minister. The passionate campaigning of Brian Connolly following the tragic death of his daughter, Lauren, has led already to real improvements in the hours that junior doctors work. Uh, working with the BME and the NHS, we have already ended the practice of junior doctors being rostered to work for seven nights in a row. And that is a major advance and it is a tribute to Mr Connolly's campaign. As a result of this and other steps, the number of hours worked by junior doctors uh, have fallen from an average of 58 hours a week in 2004 to 48 hours a week on average now. But we are determined, as the Health Secretary has said previously, to go further. Uh, so right now we're working with the BMA Scottish Junior Doctor Committee to ensure minimum rest periods following night shifts and improvement to rest facilities, while we work towards uh, what remains our goal of a 48-hour maximum week for junior doctors. And that's our work. I'm pleased the First Minister raises the heroic efforts of Brian Connolly, who lost his daughter just before she was 24, Lauren, as she was driving home after working as a junior doctor. I want to read directly from Mr Connolly's letter to the Health Secretary just this week, and I quote, You have broken your commitment to implement an actual working week of 48 hours with no averaging, as you promised to me in writing. Doctors are still being scheduled to work 12 days in a row, with some working over 117 hours between days off. Your quote to the Times in response is yet further evidence of your failure to treat this issue with the seriousness and urgency it deserves. Mr Connolly goes on, you blithely confirm that all junior doctor rotas in Scotland fully comply with the working time directive, knowing full well that any compliance with the letter of the directive is only being achieved by a combination of averaging and the continuing failure to record actual working hours. He adds, sound bites for the press are no substitute for action and are a poor camouflage for the leadership which is required to tackle this national scandal. Their excessive working hours cannot be justified. They are inherently dangerous and they must change and change soon before there are even more deaths. The responsibility for affecting the necessary change rests firmly upon your government's shoulders. So I ask the First Minister directly, will she instruct the Health Secretary to apologise to Mr Connolly and to get to grip with this scandal? First Minister. Well, look, nothing I can, can say in this chamber will ever satisfy Anas Sarwar, but I hope I can reassure Mr Connolly. I, I hope I can reassure Mr Connolly because he has uh, campaigned on this issue and I think can take great credit for some of the improvements that we have already made. When the Health Secretary wrote to Mr Connolly uh, in uh, 2015 after she met him, she said this, I believe that we can commit to this, which is the 48 hour maximum working week uh, as the longer term aim. But as I said, I wish to be in a position to be able to make this commitment with a firm and achievable timescale. That remains our position. The later letter simply recognised that in order to deliver that, we have to work with the BMA and the Junior Doctors uh, Committee. And it, it would be worth Anna Sarwar, you mentioned the Times, it would be worth Anna Sarwar reading a letter in the Times uh, two days ago from the Junior Doctors Committee uh, when it said this, it is vital for patient safety that rotas are well designed and adequately staffed. However, rather than just focusing on the number of working hours uh, in one week, a more effective way of doing this is to address specific risk areas as a priority. All we are saying is that we are working with the Junior Doctors Committee to work out how best we deliver the commitment that we have. That commitment, uh, to put it beyond any doubt, is to work towards a maximum 48-hour week. That is what Mr Connolly rightly wants us to do. But I would say again, along the way, thank you in great part to Mr Connolly we have already made a number of improvements. The end, for example, to junior doctors being rostered to work for seven nights in a row, that was one of the early demands that was made. It also reducing the average hours from 58 to 48. So progress has been made, as I say, thanks in large part to Mr Connolly, and I want to assure him today, and the Health Secretary will be very happy to meet with him again, I want to assure him today that we remain committed, working with doctors, to delivering that maximum 48-hour uh, week for junior doctors. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Anastar Arbor. The First Minister just said that the practice of seven days' work in a row has ended in the National Health Service. 
Freedom of Information requests have confirmed that that is not ended in the National Health Service, as is confirmed by Mr Connolly's letter to the Health Secretary, where people are still working 12 days in a row without a day off. So I would ask the First Minister to please withdraw that false statement, as it's incorrect and disrespectful to doctors of length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you, Mr Sarwar. That's not a point of order. He may pursue that issue with questions uh, or through the Chamber or through any means he wishes possible. It's not a point of order for now. We're now going to move to members' business in the name of Willie Rennie. I would ask members to leave quietly. We'll just take a few moments to change seats.